This is William Michael of the Classical Liberal Arts Academy, and in this video we're going to continue our study of Homer's Iliad. This video is intended for students who are enrolled in the Academy's English Literature I course, and it's intended also for students who have already studied previous videos uh, wherein we've gone through books one and two and taken our time. We've produced eight videos and we've taken our time working through the reading and discussing most of the important uh, place names, characters, other historical uh, information and uh, figures of speech uh, that we've encountered. And uh, so we're moving into the third book now of this study. And as we go, we're going to pick up the pace. So if you haven't studied lessons one and two, if you haven't worked through those previous videos, I recommend you do so because I'm not going to be repeating that information so we can try to begin making better progress through these readings. In book two, we read about the deception of Agamemnon, how he was deceived by the god Jupiter through a dream and was encouraged to go to war with the Trojans. In the dream, uh, Agamemnon was assured that he would be victorious, but this was a deceptive dream. Uh, the, the, the dream was sent by Jupiter in response to the prayer of Thetis, the mother of Achilles, that Jupiter would remember the promise made to her son to give him glory, that he would bring the Greeks into trouble. And to bring the Greeks into trouble, Jupiter stirred Agamemnon to go to war without Achilles, which is going to bring them into trouble. Uh, and then in the second half of book two, we simply had a catalog of, of the Greek ships and all of the different uh, peoples who had joined Agamemnon in the Greek armies, and then we did a similar thing going through uh, the lists of men who joined Hector in Priam's army in Troy. So. Book two we summarized as the deception of Agamemnon and preparation for battle, and we're now going to pick up in book three with the next scene. So let's read book three. Before we get started, if we look at the title that's given to this translation, we read The Duel of Menelaos and Paris, and let me just make sure that it's clear who these characters are. Menelaos was the brother of Agamemnon. He is one of the sons of Atreus. He was the brother of Agamemnon, who was the king of Argos, and Menelaos was the king of Sparta. So Menelaos is the king of Sparta, and he was the husband of Helen. Now, Helen was considered the or one of the most beautiful women in the ancient world, and Menelaos the king hosted the prince of Troy which is Paris. So Paris, traveling, visited uh, the, the, the castle of the king of Sparta and stayed as a, as a guest and broke the obligation, the, the sacred obligation that he had to respect the home of the king, of his host, and stole the wife of Menelaus, stole Her Helen. So Paris is the prince of Troy who stole Menelaus's wife. And this event, the, the stealing of Helen, some would call it the rape of Helen because the word rape really just means to kidnap or steal someone. That, that controversy between Menelaus and Paris, the sin of Paris, is really the whole cause of the Trojan War. So as we begin book two here, we read of the duel of Menelaus and Paris. Now, it would seem if there's going to be a duel between Menelaus and Paris that we'd be close to the resolution or end of this war, but we're only in book three, and there are 24 books in the Iliad, so obviously uh, we're not approaching the end of the war. So let's, let's read and find out what happens between Menelaus and Paris as the two sides get ready for battle. Let's read together. Thus, by their leader's care, each martial or military band moves into ranks and stretches o'er the land. 
With shouts the Trojans, rushing from afar, proclaim their motions and provoke or call forth the war. So, or in the same way, when inclement winters, when, when cold, uh, cold winters vex the plain with piercing frosts or thick descending rain, to warmer seas the cranes embodied fly with noise and order through the midway sky. To pygmy nations wounds and death they bring, and all the war descends upon the wing. But silent, breathing rage, resolved and skilled, by mutual aids to fix a doubtful field, swift march the Greeks. The rapid dust around, darkening arises from the labored ground. Now we have this strange mention of, of the cranes and pygmies, and most students reading this will have no idea what this is talking about. In ancient history, not necessarily mythology, this is actually ancient natural history. Um, Pliny writes about it, for example. There was said to be a, a, uh, a race of people, or I should just say a group of people, uh, who were called the pygmies, and they were said to only be about two feet high, two feet tall, I should say, a small people. And apparently when the cranes, which is a, a large bird, were driven out of northern areas by the winter and they flew south for the winter, they would fly to this land which was occupied by this pygmy people. And because the pygmies were small and they, they weren't very good at defending themselves, the cranes would fly to their land and actually beat them up quite a bit. And so there is this tradition, I guess we, should, we could say, where the cranes and the pygmies fought every spring or summer. Um, it, it, it's kind of ridiculous and funny to think about this, this, this land of small people uh, like hobbits, sort of, but they were, they were probably African. They were, they were southern because it was warmer. So this, this southern people who are very small, being invaded by birds that they, that they struggle to resist. And so we've got this, this story of the pygmies and the cranes, and Homer uh, refers to this, this story here to describe the appearance of the preparation for the battle. So that's that. That's what he's talking about there. We go on to read, Thus from his flaggy wings, when notice sheds, a night of vapors round the mountain heads, swift gliding mists the dusky fields invade, to thieves more grateful than the midnight shade. Notice here refers to uh, the south wind, the wind that comes from the south, the warm wind. Um, this is why it says, Notice sheds a night of vapors round the mountain heads. The wind causes changes in the weather. And that's what Homer is referring to here. While scarce the swains their feeding flocks survey, lost and confused amidst the thickened day. So wrapped in gathering dust the Grecian train, a moving cloud swept on and hid the plain. So all Homer's doing there is explaining the appearance of the Greek army. They're marching through the plain and stirring up lots of dust, so it's like they're traveling in a cloud. Now, front to front, the hostile armies stand, or face to face, eager of fight, and only wait command, when to the van, before the sons of fame, whom Troy sent forth the beauteous Paris, the handsome Paris, came, in form a god. The panther's speckled hide flowed o'er his armor with an easy pride. His bended bow across his shoulders flung, his sword beside him negligently hung. Two pointed spears he shook with gallant grace and dared the bravest of the Grecian race. So, quite impressively, Paris walks up to the front of the army 
and challenges the Greeks. As thus, with glorious air and proud disdain, he boldly stalked the foremost on the plain, him Menelaus, loved of Mars, that is, beloved of the god of battle, the god Mars. Menelaus him espies, with heart elated and with joyful eyes. In other words, Menelaus is licking his chops, eager for the opportunity to fight against his enemy, Paris. So joys, so here we have a simile, so joys a lion, if the branching deer or mountain goat his bulky prize appear. Eager he seizes and devours the slain, pressed by bold youths and baying dogs in vain. Thus fond of vengeance, with a furious bound, in clanging arms he leaps upon the ground, that is, Menelaus steps forward to fight Paris. From his high chariot, him approaching near, the beauteous champion views with marks of fear. Paris is afraid of Menelaus. Paris is younger. Menelaus is an older, battle-tested king. Smit with a conscious sense retires behind and shuns the fate he well deserved to find. So now uh, Big Mouth Paris is trying to take his words back and just slink his way back into the ranks. As when some shepherd, another simile, as when some shepherd from the rustling trees shot forth to view a scaly serpent sees, trembling and pale, he starts with wild affright and all confused precipitates his flight. So, from the king the shining warrior flies, and plunged amid the thickest Trojans lies. So Paris is the example of some arrogant young punk that steps up and has a lot to say, because maybe he thinks that um, no one's going to respond, and all of a sudden Menelaus steps forward to, to answer his challenge, and he didn't expect that and tries to, uh, tries to disappear before he gets his head handed to him. As godlike Hector sees the prince retreat, remember Hector is a Trojan, so he sees the Trojan prince retreat, he thus upbraids him with a generous heat. So Hector is embarrassed by this behavior of Paris and yells at him, Unhappy Paris! But to women, brave. You're only brave around women. But these are men out here in the battlefield. So fairly formed, so pretty, and only to deceive. Oh, hadst thou died when first thou sawst the light, or died at least before thy nuptial right, a better fate than vainly thus to boast and fly the scandal of thy Trojan host. So Hector says, Oh, if only you would have died as soon as you were born or before you were born, none of us would be in this situation today. There would be none of this blood spilt because of your sin. And yet here you are trying to put on some appearance of bravery. But I'm sorry to tell you, Paris, that there are men out here in the field. And Paris is an embarrassment to the Trojans. Gods, how, how the scornful Greeks exult to see their fears of danger undeceived in thee. Thy figure promised with a martial air, but ill thy soul supplies a form so fair. In former days in all thy gallant pride, when thy tall ships triumphant stemmed the tide, when Greece beheld thy painted canvas flow, and crowds stood wondering at the passing show. Say, was it thus with such a baffled mien you met the approaches of the Spartan queen, thus from her realm conveyed the beauteous prize, and both her warlike lords outshined in Helen's eyes? So Hector now is commenting on the event where Paris stole Helen away from her husband. This deed, 
thy foe's delight, thy own disgrace, thy father's grief and ruin of thy race. This deed recalls thee to the proffered fight, or hast thou injured whom thou darest not right? Soon to thy cost the field would make thee know thou keepest the consort of a braver foe. Thy graceful form, instilling soft desire, thy curling tresses, your fancy hair and pretty body, your silver lyre, beauty and youth, in vain to these you trust when youth and beauty shall be laid by warrior in dust. Troy yet may wake and one avenging blow crush the dire author of his country's woe. So Hector obviously, as it says, upbraids Paris and criticizes him, mocking his arrogance and calling him out as the cause of all the trouble. And now he's afraid when it's time to fight. His silence here with blushes, Paris breaks. So Paris responds and says, "'Tis just, my brother, what your anger speaks, but who like thee can boast a soul sedate? Not everyone's like you, Hector. So firmly proof to all the shocks of fate. Thy force like steel a tempered hardness shows, still edged to wound, and still untired with blows. So even though you're older, you're still so sharp and strong like a, like a strong sword. Like steel, uplifted by some strenuous swain, with falling woods to strew the wasted plain. Thy gifts I praise, nor thou despise the charms with which a lover, golden Venus, arms. In other words, uh, don't hate me because I'm beautiful, Hector. I respect your virtues, you should also respect mine, they come from the gods. Soft, moving speech, pleasing, outward show, no wish can gain them, but the gods bestow. Yet, wouldst thou have the proffered combat stand, the Greeks and Trojans seat on either hand, then let a midway space our host divide, and on that stage of war the cause be tried. So Paris says, look, if you want this fight to happen, let's separate the sides, open up an area in the middle, and we'll have this fight. By Paris there the Spartan king be fought for beauteous Helen and the wealth she brought. And who his rival can in arms subdue, his be the fair, his be the beautiful woman, and his treasure too. Thus, with a lasting league, your toils may cease, and Troy possess her fertile fields in peace. Thus may the Greeks review their native shore, much famed for generous steeds, for beauty more. So Paris agrees to the fight. The challenge Hector heard with joy. Hector's happy because Hector believes that Paris is the one responsible for all the trouble. He should be the one who is in danger, not the Trojan people. Then with his spear restrained the youth of Troy, held by the midst athwart, and near the foe advanced with steps majestically slow, while round his dauntless head the Grecians pour their stones and arrows in a mingled shower. Here's another example of a... a uh, an imperfect rhyme, pour and shower. We can see that the, the spelling is simple. And remember, this is a, a, a device used by Pope in the English translation, not by Homer. Then thus the monarch, great Atreides, cried, the son of Atreus. And now, at this point, we don't know if this monarch is Agamemnon or Menelaus because they're both sons of Atreus and they're both monarchs. So we'll, we'll find out who's speaking in a minute. Thus the monarch great Atreides cried, Forbear, ye warriors, lay the darts aside. A parley, Hector asks, a message bears. A parley is a, a conversation between the opposing sides of the battle. We know him by the various plume he wears. Awed by his high command, the Greeks attend. 
The tumult, silence, and the fight suspend, so the leaders of both sides are going to meet in the open field and speak together. That's what a parley is. While from the center Hector rolls his eyes on either host and thus to both applies. Hear, all ye Trojan, all ye Grecian bands, what Paris, author of this war, demands. Your shining swords within the sheath restrain, put your swords away, and pitch your lances in the yielding plain, stick your lances in the ground. Here in the midst, in either army's sight, he dares the Spartan king to single fight, and wills that Helen and the ravished spoil that caused this contest shall reward the toil. Let these, the brave, triumphant victor, grace, and different nations part in leagues of peace. He spoke. In still suspense on either side, each army stood. The Spartan chief replied, that is, Menelaos replies, Me too, you warriors here, whose fatal right a world engages in the toils of fight. To me the labor of the field resign, me, Paris, injured, all the war be mine. Fall he that must beneath his rival's arms and live the rest, secure of future harms. This is a controversy, he says, between Paris and me. Therefore, let us fight it. And when we've fought it, whoever wins, wins, and all of you can go home in peace. There's no reason for you to suffer. This is between me and Paris. Two lambs devoted by our country's right to earth a sable, to the sun a white. Sable means brown, um, and so there's two lambs, a, a colored one and a white one. Prepare, ye Trojans, prepare two lambs, while a third we bring, select to Jove the inviolable king. Let reverend Priam in the truce engage and add the sanction of considerate age. His sons are faithless, headlong in debate, and youth itself an empty wavering state. Cool age advances venerably wise. So notice the, the comparison of young and old. Old men, their passions have calmed with age and experience. Therefore, they're capable of becoming wise and respectable, whereas young men are passionate, they're hot and fiery and emotional. They get into all kinds of trouble. Older men are out of that stage, and they have, uh, they have calm spirits and clear minds. Cool age advances venerably wise, turns on all hands its deep discerning eyes, sees what befell and what may yet befall, concludes from both, and best provides for all. The nations here with rising hopes possessed, and peaceful prospects dawn in every breast. Within the lines they draw their steeds around, and from their chariots issued on the ground. Next all unbuckling the rich mail they wore, laid their bright arms along the sable shore. On either side the meeting hosts are seen with lances fixed in close the space between. Two heralds now, uh, dispatched to Troy, invite the Phrygian monarch to the peaceful rite. So two messengers are sent from uh, the battlefield back to the, uh, to the palace, to, the, to the, the castle of King Priam, to invite him to participate in this ceremony. Talthebius hastens to the fleet to bring the lamb for Jove, the inviolable king. Meantime, to beauteous Helen from the skies, the various goddess of the rainbow flies. So Iris uh, goes and visits Helen, who is back uh, in Troy. Like fair Laodice in form and face, the loveliest nymph of Priam's royal race, her in the palace, at her loom, she found. She's weaving. Helen is back in the palace, at her loom. The golden web, her own sad story crowned. The Trojan wars, she weaved, herself the prize, and the dire triumphs of her fatal eyes. So 
this bizarre woman is, is weaving uh, a fabric, if you know what a tapestry is. And in this, tapest, in this tapestry, she's depicting the Trojan Wars. Kind of bizarre to be a woman who knows you're the cause of these wars. You could probably end this war, and rather than doing something about it, you're sort of enjoying the narrative. To whom the goddess Iris of the painted bow, the goddess of the rainbow, says the following. Approach and view the wondrous scene below. Each hardy Greek and valiant Trojan knight, so dreadful late and furious for the fight, now rest their spears or lean upon their shields. Ceased is the war and silent all the fields. Paris alone and Sparta's king advance. So your boyfriend and your ex-husband step forward in single fight to toss the beamy lance. They're going to duel over you, woman, over you, Helen. Each met in arms the fate of combat tries. Thy love, the motive, and thy charms, the prize. This said, the many-colored maid inspires her husband's love and wakes her former fires. Her country, parents, all that once were dear, rush to her thought and force a tender tear. Helen sees her husband Menelaus going through this trial because of her, and she cries about it. O'er her face, a snowy veil she threw, and softly sighing from her loom withdrew. Her handmaids, Clymene and Ethra, wait her silent footsteps to the Skyan gate. There sat the seniors of the Trojan race, old Priam's chiefs and most in Priam's grace, the king the first, Thymoites at his side, Lampus and Clitius long in council tried, Panthus and Hicateon, once the strong, and next the wisest of the reverend throng, Antenor, grave and sage, Eucalegon, leaned on the walls and basked before the sun. Chiefs, who no more in bloody fights engage because of their age, but wise through time and narrative with age, in summer days, like, notice another simile, in summer days, like grasshoppers rejoice, a bloodless race that send a feeble voice, these, when the Spartan queen approached the tower in secret owned resistless beauty's power. So the men see Helen and they say, whoa, she's beautiful. I can understand why these men are fighting over her. They cried, no wonder such celestial charms for nine long years have set the world at arms. What winning graces, what majestic mien. She moves like a goddess and she looks like a queen. Yet hence, O oh heaven, convey that fatal face and from destruction save the Trojan race. The good old Priam welcomed her and cried, Approach, my child, and grace thy father's side. See on the plain thy Grecian spouse appears, the friends and kindred of thy former years. No crime of thine our present sufferings draws, not thou, but heaven's disposing will the cause. It's not your fault, Helen. It's God's will. The gods these armies and this force employ, the hostile gods conspire the fate of Troy. Far as from thence these aged orbs can see, around whose brow such martial graces shine, so tall, so awful, and almost divine. None match his grandeur and exalted mien. He seems a monarch and his country's pride. Thus ceased the king, and thus the fair replied. So Helen now responds to Priam, her father-in-law. Before thy presence, father, I appear with conscious shame and reverential fear. Ah, that I died! Ah, had I died! 
Ere to these walls I fled, false to my country and my nuptial bed. So Helen admits, she confesses her sin here. My brothers, friends, and daughter left behind, false to them all, to Paris only kind. For this I mourn, till grief or dire disease shall waste the form whose fault it was to please. The king of kings, Atrides, you survey, great in the war and great in arts of sway. My brother once, before my days of shame, and oh, what that still he bore a brother's name. With ponder, Priam viewed the godlike man, extolled the happy prince, and thus began. So Priam speaks here and says, O blessed Atreides, blessed son of Atreus, speaking of Menelaus, born to prosperous fate, successful monarch of a mighty state, how vast thy empire, of your matchless train, what numbers lost, what numbers yet remain. In Phrygia once were gallant armies known, in ancient times when Otreus filled the throne, when godlike Migdon led their troops of horse, and I to join them raised the Trojan force. Against the man-like Amazons we stood, and Sangar's stream ran purple with their blood, but far inferior those in martial grace and strength of numbers to this Grecian race. This said, once more he viewed the warrior train. What's he? So picture the scene here. Priam, the old king, and Helen, the wife of his son, are looking out from the palace at the battle scene, and Priam sees all of these great Greek soldiers, and now he asks Helen about them. Who's that? Who's that? What's that guy? And so on. He says, what's he? whose arms lie scattered on the plain. Broad is his breast and shoulders larger spread, though great Atrides overtops his head. Nor yet appear his care and conduct small. From rank to rank he moves and orders all. The stately ram thus measured o'er the ground and master of the flock surveys them round. He says, who's that man? He seems to be important, pointing at one of the men in the Greek army, one of the leaders. Thus are then Helen thus, so Helen answers and says, Whom your discerning eyes have singled out is Ithacus the wise. Now who is Ithacus? Ithacus is a name used to refer to Ulysses or Odysseus. Remember, Ithaca is the island from which um, Ulysses came. So he's referred to as Ithacus or the man from Ithaca. A barren island boasts his glorious birth. His fame for wisdom fills the spacious earth. Antenor took the word and thus began. Myself, O king, I have seen that wondrous man, when, trusting Jove and hospitable laws, to Troy he came to plead the Grecian cause. Great Menelaus urged the same request. My house was honored with each royal guest. I knew their persons and admired their parts, both brave in arms and both approved in arts. Erect, the Spartan most engaged our view, Ulysses seated, greater reverence drew. When Atreus' son harangued the listening train, just was his sense and his expression plain. Helen then replies to Priam and says, he whom your discerning eyes have singled out is Ithacus, the wise. I mentioned in <clears throat> Book 2 that Ithacus is a name here used by Pope to refer to Ulysses. Ulysses was king of Ithaca, which is an island west of Greece, and he's referred to, to as Ithacus, which means the man of Ithaca. So Helen says to Priam, whom your discerning eyes have singled out is Ithacus the wise, that is Ulysses. A barren island boasts his glorious birth. His fame for wisdom fills the spacious earth. Antenor took the word and thus 
began. So Antenor speaks, Myself, O king, have seen that wondrous man, when, trusting Jove and hospitable laws, to Troy he came to plead the Grecian cause. Great Menelaos urged the same request. My house was honored with each royal guest. I knew their persons and admired their parts, both brave in arms and both approved in arts. Erect, the Spartan most engaged our view, Ulysses seated, greater reverence drew. When Atreus' son harangued the listening train, just was his sense and his expression plain. His words, succinct yet full, without a fault, he spoke no more than just the thing he ought. Now notice here, we have Homer s speaking through Antenor, and yet we're learning here something of the art of rhetoric. We learn that he spoke justly, Atreus' son spoke justly and plainly. Just was his sense, his expression plain, his words succinct, brief and to the point, yet full, without a fault. He spoke no more than just the thing he ought. He was an eloquent speaker, a just and wise man with simple speech. A good lesson in rhetoric. But when Ulysses rose in thought profound, his modest eyes he fixed upon the ground. As one unskilled or dumb he seemed to stand, nor raised his head, nor stretched his sceptered hand. But when he speaks, what elocution flows, soft as the fleeces of descending snows, the copious accents fall with easy art, melting they fall and sink into the heart, wondering, amazed we hear, we listen, and fixed in deep surprise our ears refute the censure of our eyes. So he says that Ulysses was not much to look at, he was a humble, modest man, but he was most eloquent. And so you can see how here in, in the Iliad, we have these moral lessons, these lessons in the classical liberal arts, a lesson on rhetoric mixed in here by Homer. This is what I, what I meant in the opening video when I explained that the Iliad was for the Greeks something like a Bible for Christians, full of moral teaching, full of teaching of the classical liberal arts, teaching on education, teaching on character, and so on. All of that is worked into these speeches by Homer. And this is his, his master craft as a poet, not just to tell a story, but to, to really do so much more than, than tell a story. The king, Priam, then asked, as yet the camp he viewed, what chief is that? Who is that man with giant strength endued, whose brawny shoulders and whose swelling chest and lofty stature far exceed the rest? Ajax, the great, the beauteous queen, replied, <clears throat> himself a host, in other words, a one-man army, the Grecian strength and pride. See, Bold Idomeneus, superior towers amid young circle of his Cretan powers, great as a god, I saw him once before with Menelaos on the Spartan shore. The rest I know and could in order name all valiant chiefs and men of mighty fame. Now, this sounds great, but realize that Helen is here boasting about all of these great, impressive warriors in the Greek army. This isn't a very welcome description for Priam, the king whose son is down there among his own soldiers about to fight these men. Helen is rambling about all of the virtues and strengths and greatness and the eloquence of the Greek leaders 
This isn't a message that Priam must be very happy to hear. She says, Yet, however, two are wanting of the numerous train, whom long my eyes have sought, but sought in vain, Castor and Pollux. First in martial force, one bold on foot, and one renowned for horse, my brothers these. The same our native shore, one house contained us as one mother bore. So she's looking for her brothers, Castor and Pollux, and she doesn't see them. Perhaps the chiefs from warlike toils at ease, for distant Troy refused to sail the seas. Perhaps their swords some nobler quarrel draws, ashamed to combat in their sister's cause. So spoke the fair, the beautiful woman, nor knew her brother's doom, wrapped in the cold embraces of the tomb, adorned with honors in their native shore, silent they slept and heard of wars no more. Her brothers were dead. Meantime the heralds through the crowded town bring the rich wine and destined victims down. Idaeus' arms the golden goblets pressed, who thus the venerable king addressed. Arise, O father of the Trojan state, the nations call, thy joyful people wait, to seal this truce and end the dire debate. Paris, thy son, and Sparta's king advance in measured lists to toss the weighty lance and who his rival shall in arms subdue, his be the dame, and his the treasure too. Thus, with a lasting league, our toils may cease, and Troy possess her fertile fields in peace. So shall the Greeks review their native shore, much famed for generous steeds, for beauty more. So this message is announced to Priam that there's good news. The Greeks and the Trojans are going to stop fighting. Well, there's also bad news. The reason why they're going to stop fighting is because Paris and Menelaus are going to go one-on-one, winner-take-all. And you can imagine to be Priam, to hear that this is a fight that your son is going to fight in against an older and experienced and famous king. This news isn't so great. With grief he heard and bade the chiefs prepare to join his milk-white coursers, horses, to the car. He mounts the seat on tenor at his side. The gentle steeds through Skaya's gates they guide. Next, from the car descending on the plain, amid the Grecian host and Trojan train, slow they proceed. The sage Ulysses then arose, and with him rose the king of men. On either side a sacred herald stands. The wine they mix, and on each monarch's hands. Now, Here's another important religious and historical lesson in the Iliad. We see how uh, a covenant or an agreement is made between leaders of different states or between two sides of uh, of a battle. We see that they, they arrange to have this agreement and meet together and settle this in a reasonable way. And they celebrate because they're hoping that all of the evils of war will come to an end. The wine they mix, and on each monarch's hands, pour the full urn, then draws the Grecian lord, his cutlass sheathed beside his ponderous sword. From the signed victims crops the curling hair. The herald parts it and the princes share. Then, loudly, thus, before the attentive bands, he calls the gods and spreads his lifted hands. 
O first and greatest power whom all obey, who high on Ida's holy mountains sway, eternal Jove, and you, bright orb, that roll from east to west and view from pole to pole, that is, the sun. Thou, Mother Earth, and all ye living floods, infernal furies and Tartarian gods, who rule the dead and horrid woes prepare for perjured kings and all who falsely swear. So notice that uh, perjury or treachery were considered to be the greatest of evils. Hear and be witness, if by Paris slain, great Menelaus press the fatal plain, the dame and treasures let the Trojan keep, and Greece returning plow the watery deep. If by my brother's lance the Trojan bleed, be his the wealth and beauteous dame decreed. The appointed fine let Ilion, Troy, justly pay, and every age record this signal day. This, if the Phrygians shall refuse to yield, arms must revenge, and Mars, the god of war, decide the field. So Agamemnon offers this prayer, uh, asking the gods to witness this agreement that's about to be made between the leaders of the Greeks and the Trojans. With that, the chief, the tender victims slew, and in the dust their bleeding bodies threw. The vital spirit issued at the wound and left the members quivering on the ground. From the same urn they drink the mingled wine and add libations to the powers divine. While thus their prayers united, mount the sky. Hear, mighty Jove, and hear, ye gods on high, and may their blood, who first the league confound, shed like this wine, disdain the thirsty ground. May all their consorts serve promiscuous lust, and all their lust be scattered as the dust. So these are curses spoken in the hearing of the gods, as it were, on any who would break this agreement. Thus, either host their imprecations or prayers joined, which Jove refused and mingled with the wind. So while these men are imagining themselves to be carrying out all of these rites and making these prayers and agreements, in the heavens, Jove is simply ignoring them because none of this is actually going to stand. The rites now finished, Reverend Priam rose and thus expressed a heart or charged with woes. So while all of this apparently good news is being reported, realize that Priam knows his son is going to get slaughtered by King Menelaus. And so this isn't I guess we could say this is bittersweet news to Priam, but he knows that his son is in danger. He says, Ye Greeks and Trojans, let the chiefs engage, but spare the weakness of my feeble age. In yonder walls that object let me shun, nor view the danger of so dear a son, whose arms shall conquer and what prince shall fall Heaven only knows, for heaven disposes all. So Priam said, thanks for inviting me. God bless this agreement between the Greeks and the Trojans, but really, I, I can't stay here and watch this. I'm going to go back to the palace. This said the hoary or white-headed king no longer stayed but on his car the slaughtered victims laid, then seized the reins his gentle steeds to guide and drove to Troy on tenor at his side. Bold Hector, the chief warrior of the Trojans, and Ulysses, the greatest of the Greeks without Achilles, now dispose the lists of combat and the ground enclose. 
Next, to decide by sacred lots, prepare who first shall launch his pointed spear in air. So we're getting ready for this duel. The people pray with elevated hands, and words like these are heard through all the bands. Immortal Jove, high heaven's superior lord, on lofty Ida's holy mount adored, who e'er involved us in this dire debate, O oh, give that author of the war to fate and shades eternal. Let division cease and joyful nations join in leagues of peace. So they call upon the gods to judge between Paris and Menelaos and allow this to end in justice and peace for all of the people. With eyes averted, Hector hastes to turn the lots of fight and shakes the brazen urn. Then Paris, thine leaped forth, by fatal chance ordained the first to whirl the weighty land. So they basically flipped the coin to see who would throw the spear first. Remember, there's no guns here, obviously, and, and think of a, a, a duel with guns, but imagine it with spears instead, where these men are going to stand apart and throw spears at each other. What they're going to do is take turns, and so they, they drew lots, or flipped the coin, as it were, to decide who would throw first, and Paris won the coin toss and learned that he would throw first. Both armies sat, the combat to survey. Beside each chief, his azure armor lay. And round the lists, the generous coursers nay. The beauteous warrior now arrays for fight in gilded or golden arms magnificently bright. The purple quishes clasp his thighs around. I don't know what that word means. With flowers adorned, with silver buckles bound. Lucaon's corslet, his fair body dressed, braced in and fitted to his softer breast. A radiant baldric o'er his shoulder tied, sustained the sword that glittered at his side. His youthful face, a polished helm or spread, helmet or spread. The waving horsehair nodded on his head. His figured shield, a shining orb, he takes, and in his le hand a pointed javelin shakes. With equal speed and fired by equal charms, the Spartan hero sheathes his limbs in arms. Now round the lists the admiring armies stand, with javelins fixed the Greek and Trojan band, amidst the dreadful vale or valley. The chiefs advance, all pale with rage, and shake the threatening lance. The Trojan first his shining javelin threw. Full on Atrides' ringing shield it flew. So Paris throws first and strikes Menelaus straight on, striking his shield nor pierced the brazen orb, it did not pierce his bronze shield, but with a bound leaped from the buckler, blunted on the ground. So Paris's first throw struck Menelaus in the shield, but ricocheted off the shield and landed on the ground. Atrides then, that is Menelaus, the son of Atreus, Atrides then, his massy lance prepares in act to throw, but first prefers his prayers. Give me, great Jove, to punish lawless lust and lay this Trojan gasping in the dust. Destroy the aggressor, aid my righteous cause, avenge the breach of hospitable laws. Let this example future times reclaim and guard from wrong fair friendship's holy name. So Menelaos makes this rather impressive prayer for God to assist him and bring about justice in this situation. He spoke 
and poised in air the javelin sent through Paris's shield. The forceful weapon went, his corslet pierces, and his garment rends, and glancing downward near his flank descends. The wary Trojan, bending from the blow, eludes the death and disappoints the foe. So he got struck, Paris was struck, but not fatally. But fierce Atrides waved his sword and struck Full on his casque, the crested helmet shook. The brittle steel, unfaithful to his hand, broke short, and fragments glittered on the sand. The raging warrior to the spacious skies raised his upbraiding voice and angry eyes. Then is it vain in Jove himself to trust, and is it thus the gods assist the just? So Menelaus goes to strike Paris with his sword, and his sword shatters. And he looks up to the heavens and says, Is this how the gods repay a man seeking justice who's been wronged? He says, When crimes provoke us, heaven's success denies. The dart falls harmless, and the falchion flies. Furious, he said, and towards the Grecian crew, seized by the crest, the unhappier warrior drew. Struggling, he followed, while the embroidered thong that tied his helmet dragged the chief along. Then had his ruin crowned Atrides' joy. To stop there for one moment, Menelaus simply grabbed hold of Paris by the head and was ready to kill him, and was dragging him by his helmet. Then had his ruin crowned Atrides' joy, just when Menelaus was about to satisfy his desire for vengeance, Venus trembled for the prince of Troy, the goddess Venus, or Aphrodite, the goddess of love and beauty who loved Paris, trembled for the prince of Troy. Unseen she came and burst the golden band and left an empty helmet in his hand. The cask enraged amidst the Greeks he threw, the Greeks with smiles the polished trophy view. So Venus came and cut loose the helmet so that Paris could escape. Then, as once more he lifts the deadly dart, as Menelaus lifts the deadly dart, in thirst of vengeance at his rival's heart, the queen of love, that is Venus, her favored champion shrouds. She makes him invisible, for gods can all things in a veil of clouds. Raised from the field, The panting youth she led and gently laid him on the bridal bed. With pleasing sweets, his fainting sense renews, and all the dome perfumes with heavenly dews. So Venus rescues Paris from the battlefield. Meantime, the brightest of the female kind the matchless Helen o'er the walls reclined. To her, beset with Trojan beauties, came in borrowed form the laughter-loving dame. So Helen returns to the palace, not knowing what's going on, and Venus then goes to visit her. She seemed, she, she went in the appearance of an old woman. She seemed an ancient maid, well skilled to call, the snowy fleece, and wind the twisted wool. The goddess softly shook her silken vest that shed perfumes and whispering thus addressed. (coughs) Haste, hurry, happy nymph, for thee thy Paris calls, safe from the fight in yonder lofty walls, fair as a god. With odors round him spread, he lies and waits thee on the well-known bed. (coughs) 
<coughs> not like a warrior parted from the foe, but some gay dancer in the public show. So Venus has rescued Paris from the battlefield, brought him home, dressed him and perfumed him, made him beautiful as usual, and says to Helen, hey, guess what? Paris is in your room. She spoke, and Helen's secret soul was moved. She scorned the champion, but the man she loved. Fair Venus's neck, her eyes that sparkled fire and breast revealed the queen of soft desire. Struck with her presence, straight the lively red forsook her cheek and trembling, thus she said. Then is it still thy pleasure to deceive and woman's frailty always to believe? Say, two new nations must I cross the main or carry wars to some soft Asian plain? For whom must Helen break her sacred vow? What other Paris is thy darling now? Left to Atrides, victor in the strife, an odious conquest and a captive wife. Hence let me sail, and if thy Paris bear my absence ill, let Venus ease his care. A handmaid goddess at his side to wait, renounce the glories of thy heavenly state, be fixed forever to the Trojan shore, his spouse or slave, and mount the skies no more. For me, to lawless love no longer led, there's an example of alliteration, lawless love no longer led. I scorn the coward and detest his bed. So Helen rejects Paris. Else should I merit everlasting shame and keen reproach from every Phrygian dame. Ill suits it now the joys of love to know. Too deep my anguish and too wild my woe. So Helen refuses to return to Paris. Then thus incensed, the Paphian queen replies, Obey the power from whom thy glories rise. Should Venus leave thee, should the goddess of beauty leave thee, every charm must fly, fade from thy cheek and languish in thy eye. In other words, you better be careful, Helen, that you don't speak against Venus because all of your fame, all of your charm and beauty and success, they all come from her. Cease to provoke me, lest I make thee more the world's aversion than their love before. I'll make the world hate you more than they've ever loved you. Now the bright prize for which mankind engage then the sad victim of the public rage. At this the fairest of her sex Helen obeyed and veiled her blushes in a silken shade. Unseen and silent from the train she moves, led by the goddess of the smiles and loves. Arrived and entered at the palace gate, the maids officious round their mistress wait. Officious means dutiful, ready to serve her. Then all dispersing various tasks attend, the queen and goddess to the prince ascend. Full in her Paris's sight the queen of love had placed the beauteous progeny of Jove. Where, as he viewed her charms, she turned away her glowing eyes and thus began to say, Is this the chief who, lost to sense of shame, Late fled the field, and yet survives his fame. O oh, hadst thou died beneath the righteous sword Of that brave man whom once I called my lord. So Helen criticizes and mocks Paris. The boaster Paris oft desired the day With Sparta's king to meet in single fray. You always talked, Paris, about how you wanted to to fight against Menelaus. Go now, once more thy rival's rage excite, provoke Atreides and renew the fight. 
Yet Helen bids thee stay, lest thou unskilled shouldst fall an easy conquest on the field. The prince replies, Ah, cease, divinely fair, nor add reproaches to the wounds I bear. This day the foe prevailed by Pallas's power, Athena. We yet may vanquish in a happier hour. There want not gods to favor us above, but let the business of our life be love. Think of how crazy Paris is. He's the source of this whole battle, this whole war. And here he is still talking about love and pleasure. These softer moments let delights employ, and kind embraces snatch the hasty joy. Not thus I loved thee when from Sparta's shore my forced, my willing, heavenly prize I bore. I didn't drag you away from Sparta. You came with me willingly. When first entranced in Cranai's isle I lay, mixed with thy soul and all dissolved away. Thus having spoke, the enamored Phrygian boy rushed to the bed impatient for the joy. Him Helen followed. She couldn't resist Paris, slow with bashful charms and clasped the blooming hero in her arms. While these to love's delicious rapture yield, the stern Atreides rages round the field. Menelaus on the other hand, is angry because, again, the gods have actually refused to allow him to avenge the injustice that he suffered. So he's angry. While Helen and Paris are back in the palace, enjoying each other, Menelaus is left out in the field. So some fell lion whom the woods obey roars through the desert and demands his prey. Menelaus is like a lion demanding his prey. Paris he seeks, impatient to destroy, but seeks in vain among the troops of Troy. Even those had yielded to a foe so brave, the recreant warrior hateful as the grave. They would have handed Paris over if he was among them, because they hated him as well. Then, speaking thus, the king of kings arose. Ye Trojans, Dardans, all our generous foes, hear and attest. From heaven with conquest crowned, our brother arms the just success have found. Be therefore now the Spartan wealth restored. Let Argive Helen own her lawful lord, the appointed fine, let Ilion justly pay, and age to age record this signal day. Agamemnon argues that everyone watched what happened, everyone saw what happened, everyone saw that Menelaus had won. <clears throat> Therefore, let that be the end to this. He ceased. His armies loud applauses rise, and the long shout runs echoing through the skies. And as you see, that brings us to the end of book three. So book three, as the title at the beginning of the book says, we find the account of the duel between Menelaus and Paris. <clears throat> Make sure you pay attention to the influence of the gods and goddesses in this book. Um, a very simple book in terms of summarizing but um, there, are, there were many good lessons in this book, good lessons on religion, good lessons on uh, the liberal arts and rhetoric. Remember, talk about uh, the eloquence of some of the leading Greek men, the character of Odysseus, and so on. We also see the hateful character of Paris, just what a, what a real slime ball he is, how selfish he is, concerned with nothing but his own pleasure. That's a good character study to, to reflect on. We also see Helen as, as sort of a, uh, a representative of the weakness of women. She has principles, she has feelings and desires, but it's as if she can't resist um, the charms of this handsome Paris, and he forces her 
even though it appears to be willing on her part, it's because he's irresistible to her, and there's sort of this teaching on the weak character of women. And then again, we have the role of the gods and goddesses working above the scenes, we could say, to actually direct the affairs of men and control the outcomes of their actions. So there's a lot to think about in book three. And uh, I hope that that's a helpful guide. We, we got through this whole video, this whole book, I should say, in one video. Uh, it took an hour, and right now we're at an hour and 10 minutes or so. Uh, so that's pretty good. I hope that's a helpful guide. Um, now study the book for yourself. Use this knowledge now to go and read it for yourself. Understand the text yourself. So in the future, you can make use of this book and, and use it as your own, not simply referring to things that I've said, but, but read and understand and see and use them for yourself. I hope that's helpful. God bless.